Um, I've come today just to give you an update about what NICC standards is, um, so you can understand the, uh, the activity that we do and see whether or not you, uh, you wish to get involved in it. Um, I'm here today as a director of NICC for my day job uh, in line with most people who do activity within NICC. Uh, I work for a communications provider, so I work for Vodafone for my day job. So I'm going to take you through what NICC is, um, why we actually need UK standards, because fundamentally NICC is a standards organisation, uh, a quick history of how NICC came about, uh, what we're doing now, and then I'll just touch on uh, how, you, how you will become a member if you, any of this is of interest to you. So what we are is the design authority for the telecoms network in the UK. Um, there isn't a single telecoms network, obviously. There's a series of interconnected networks. We deal with how those, in, those uh, networks interoperate. We come up with UK interoperability standards. Our standards draw upon international activity, and the type of thing that we underpin is interworking of traditional telephony te uh, networks, TDM networks, uh, next generation networks running SIP. Um, we deal with access networks and making those commu commercially neutral, so it allows the likes of TalkTalk, Talk, EE, Virgin, Sky, Vodafone to use OpenReach's network. Um, we deal with those type of legacy services that we all take for granted nowadays, number portability, when you change provider for telecoms, you can take your number with you. Call in line identity, it's useful to have a number that comes up on the phone when somebody calls you, albeit it is getting a little bit dodgy, I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, network security, uh, we came up with a set of network security guidelines which major telcos are expected to comply with by the government nowadays. And end-to-end -end service quality, um, a portion in the delay budget between individual telcos to make sure that uh, you end up with a viable voice service. So why UK standards? Because UK standards aren't a good thing. Why would you ever want a national standard? It implies that you're having to buy kit which is specially configured for the UK. That's only ever going to drive additional cost. We've got international standards anyway. We've got the IETF, uh, we've got Broadband Forum, uh, Etsy, and to a degree we even take notice of the ITU as well. So given all of those international standards, why on earth would you want to develop UK ones? And the answer is that in general we don't. Um, where NIC standards tend to operate is in two, different st in two different areas. Firstly, the international uh, standards have got a, a whole lot of options within there, so we profile them so that UK operators work on the same page. And secondly, there's a certain amount of where we find uh, international standards don't quite meet what we need in the UK. We drive the international standards to actually uh, deliver the UK capabilities we need. So in terms of profiling those international standards, uh, doing this in a little bit more detail, International standards generally have options within there of how things can be supported. Uh, certainly, for example, if I'm looking at SIP on a user interface, I can think of at least four or five different ways that you can signal that you don't want to pass a call in line identity. Um, it is useful if the options uh, which BT choose to implement are the same ones that TalkTalk Talk choose to implement, the same ones that Vodafone tend to implement, rather than us all going down our own merry little way. So what we do is come up with a profile so that UK operators work on the same uh, basis. We also need to take the international standards and consider what needs to be done at them to meet uh, particularly UK regulatory needs. Ofcom do like to put particular requirements on us and we have to make sure that our networks can support them. The other side of things is driving international standards. And I think it's fair to say that international standards agencies and a blank sheet of paper don't mix particularly well. There needs to be a certain amount of socialization of concepts before you get to the scenario where you're in a huge room with three or four hundred people, 15 different native languages. It's useful if you've had some kind of socialization of ideas so that you've had the rough edges knocked off them before you get into that international layer. The other aspect, though, is that sometimes business needs dictate a national solution because you need a solution that goes in really quickly, which would be nice if it could be internationally standardised thereafter. A uh, classic case of this is some of the access things we've done in the UK. We've had to be ahead of the international standardisation 
because basically there weren't any international standards there. There was a regulatory requirement, a commercial requirement to do something. We had to uh, develop something quick and dirty in the UK and then take it internationally to get international agreement. So the other aspect on driving international standards is when we come to do the profiling of uh, IETF standards or ITU standards or ETSI standards, we tend to identify holes in them and flaws and things which hadn't really been thought of before we actually got to implementation. What we can then do is take those back into the international agencies as individual member <coughs> organisations. So classic one on this is SIP Uni at the moment. Uh, SIP is session, session Initiation Protocol, I'm sure you're all aware. Um, we're harmonising a, uh, a UK uni. So basically you would have a standard baseline that UK operators will support and then you can have options thereafter in order to have differentiation. Now what we've found, we're profiling a SIP Connect um, standard and some of the options which are put in there basically not only will, are, are they not what we would particularly want in the UK, if implemented they would, they would cause us real difficulty. I think a classic one is the uh, the method, one of the mechanisms which is in there at the moment of uh, signalling that you don't want to release your CLI, you call it line identity, is to send anonymous at anonymous. That isn't any good to us at all because even when uh, calling line identities have been withheld, we still carry them in the UK network. They're still carried within the telco network. It's necessary for things like law enforcement. So the option of putting anonymous at anonymous just isn't a starter and shouldn't really be in that standard. So that's what Nick does. A potted history of how we came about. We, our history basically extends as far back as the uh, UK competitive telco industry. So it probably goes back to about 1990, 1991. In those days, we were a committee of Ofttel reporting into the, what was the Director General of Ofttel. In 2002, Ofttel ceased to be, and we got Ofcom instead. And the subtle difference there is that Oftel was formerly a uh, government body, whereas Ofcom is a freestanding organisation, albeit directed by government, but they are notionally independent of government. Now, Ofcom introduced a far more co-regulatory approach than what had existed beforehand, which in plain English is you guys go and sort things out between yourselves and it's only if you can't agree that we want to know we're not going to direct things in the same way that Oftel had in the past. So at that stage, NICC standards were spun off as an industry-owned body and we're now a membership organisation owned by the major telcos and the major equipment vendors to those telcos. So some of the things we've done over the years... Um, the very fact that you can make a, call, a phone call from BT to a Vodafone handset and it will work relies on very legacy technology called C7. Uh, we standardised those protocols so that they would work between operators. Calling line identity, that was about 1995. We introduced that so that you could actually know who was ringing you, subject to uh, caveats around it being spoofed. Number portability, that was about 1997, uh, allowing you to take your number from one telco to another when you uh, change provider. Location for 999 service, uh, fundamentally when you call 999, uh, the agency knows where you are in order to get the ambulance or police dispatched out to you. That equally applies on your mobile phone as well. We use cell IDs in order to locate where you are so that we can get the authorities out to you and the appropriate authorities out to you. Uh, the access network frequency plan, which is something incredibly important. Um, local loop and bundling has been the real powerhouse of competition in the UK both in terms of voice telephony and uh, internet connectivity. The ramp up of speeds, of broadband speeds, has occurred because of competition, which, be, uh, which allowed operators like TalkTalk, like Cable and Wireless, as was, like Sky, to unbundle their own copper loops and put their own equipment on the end of it and drive up those access speeds. However, they couldn't uh, use that kit without some form of uh, uh, cooperation between the individual telcos because, frankly, if you put too much bandwidth down one particular copper pair, it would wipe out the whole lot and you would end up with other, 
other people's suppliers, other people's customers not being able to get any kind of uh, service. So what we have is something called the ANF, ANFP, Engaging Teeth, which basically sets out the frequencies that can be used on the copper pairs in order that everybody shares a, a reasonable amount of bandwidth. And that is standardised within NICC. Uh, we've got standards allowing competition in next generation access, which we'll come on to in a moment. Um, we've come up with, uh, in essence, the uh, next generation equivalent of the legacy stuff so that we can interconnect our voice networks now that we're all running SIP networks. So just a quick case study. I'm not going to go through this in any great detail because I'm conscious of time. I'm conscious of requirement for beer. Um, next generation access. Local loop and bundling has been a, like I say, a great competitive enabler, but it's fundamentally predicated on there being a copper pair going from the BT exchange out to indi each individual customer. As we move on to next generation access, particularly fibre to the home, you no longer have that. You've got a star configuration. So what we needed to do was develop some standards so that uh, individual operators at an Ethernet level could have individual VLANs through to their customer base and get that handed over to them. It's the nearest we could get to local loop and bundling in a fibre environment. Also, when you've got fibre through to the customer, you've got the scenario where you can no longer run the traditional analogue voice service. The whole lot becomes voice over IP. Uh, the way that the open reach uh, service is put together it is that it has a telephony adapter actually in the socket on the wall. It's useful if that telephony adapter can be controlled by individual CP's uh, call service because that way, as far as the customer's concerned, it looks like traditional voice. It isn't actually. We, we obfuscate that from them. So Nick was asked, we're coming up with some standards about how we actually implement this. And without going into a huge amount of detail, it's just to show there's an awful lot of standards which are associated with it. So we, ended, we had to come up with some requirements to, uh, to support the regulatory uh, requirement which uh, had been put forward by Ofcom. Uh, given those requirements, you needed to develop an architecture, a service definition, specifications for the UNI and the network interface, management specifications, and then we're when we go on to the voice application layer, you basically got the same thing rep replicated for voice as well. And this is an example of one of the ones where we used international standards where possible, but we were leading things in terms of we were the first country to be implementing this, this kind of competitive architecture. So the activity we're working on at the moment, well, unfortunately, this being PDF has somewhat corrupted this, uh, this page. The structure that we have is that we have a series of topic groups which look at key areas. So the ones that we've got at the moment is we've got a group which is looking at emergency location. Um, so if you're running a, an I, a voice over IP service and you want to provide 999 service, we're putting together an architecture there so we can actually locate where the customers are. Uh, nuisance call in CLI is one that I'm uh, running, uh, which is basically trying to deal with all those spam calls which we're plagued with all the time, selling PPI at the moment. Uh, we have a group looking at DSL technologies, um, a group which is just about uh, wrapping up now on active line access, which was the NGA stuff I just uh, outlined. These are all temporary groups which form, do a piece of activity, then close down. Separate to that, we have a series of subject experts who keep consistency across those, uh, those topic groups. So what we delivered last year, um, DSL group, we came up with a wise only test plan for VDSL2. Um, Enterprise SIP, we have basically uh, delivered a NNI architecture. We're moving on to the UNI uh, signaling standards at the moment. Uh, the active line access stuff was wrapping up and was basically dealing with the management interfaces. Nuisance calling, um, we have been looking at a mechanism which is more of a process than a technical uh, solution, but it is where Ofcom have got a series of complaints about uh, a large number of customers getting calls from particular numbers. We've got a mechanism in place so that Ofcom can then go via the individual CPs and trace where those calls have come from with a view to closing the, uh, the spammers down. It's a short-term solution. The longer-term solution comes from my ETF on that. What we've got on the work stack at the moment, um, exchange-based VDSL2 uh, is something that Sky and TalkTalk Talk have been uh, pushing in particular. 
Uh, dynamic spectrum management techniques uh, for DSL, which hopefully will crank up the bandwidth even more on DSL so we can uh, try and get that quarter out of a pint pot. Um, vectoring use cases, again, pretty much on the same page on that. On the uh, SIP and Enterprise activity, uh, we're, signaling, we're, we're uh, specifying this corporate uh, SIP signaling interface. The Network Integrity Task Group is looking at um, some guidelines which Ofcom have asked us to put together basically to stop customers who configure their own uh, PBX or asterisk servers, uh, prevent the, uh, the use of DAL3 fraud on them, just giving them some advice, best practice advice. Uh, we need to finish off the final bit of the ALA task group, and I don't know if Chris is still around to actually indicate. Have you finished it yet, Chris? Right, okay. Uh, the nuisance call trace, uh, nuisance calls and CLI guidelines, um, we're currently trialling the nuisance call tracing process at the moment. Uh, once we get the outcome of that process, we'll be updating the, uh, the standard appropriately. Um, we're updating the CLI guidelines, which underpin the regulation on call and line identity, basically to try and make it comprehensible. The existing document is pretty impenetrable. We're trying to make it readable to the new generation of voice providers who you know, basically work over the internet. Emergency uh, location is looking at the end-to-end -end, uh, use of IP. So when we're in, the, in a world where we're accessing 999 services, not using legacy networks anymore, how we, end, how we get the <coughs> location of the caller in those scenarios. So membership. I mentioned we've got quite a wide membership. Uh, we've got over about 50 members at the moment, which cover uh, traditional fixed communications providers, internet telephony providers, mobile providers like, uh, like myself, uh, equipment vendors, um, government and regulators. We have Ofcom, BIS, and CPNI in there keeping an eye on us. Um, we are a membership organisation. We've got to pay for uh, our facilities, so therefore there is a charge to join, unfortunately. Uh, and that is uh, for full members, which uh, means uh, if you get voting rights, that's two and a half thousand a year. Uh, for associate members, it's a 1250 a year. This compares really pretty well with other countries. I mean, certainly I'm aware that the equivalent organisation in New Zealand, you can, you can add a couple of zeros on that in terms of the pricing of, uh, of their membership. So that concludes, really. Uh, any questions? I'm more than happy to take them. Hi, it's Simon Lockhart from CableCon and Bogons. Um, the standards you produce, are they publicly available? Do you have to be a member to access them? No, you don't need to be a member. They are publicly available on the website, the nextstandards.org.uk. Thank you. Uh, free, free of charge as well. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Okay.